Good morning, everyone. Can I hear a good morning from both in person and from online? Good morning. Oh, come on. <laughs> good morning. Uh, it is a good morning here in Summerside, and we are streaming live from Center 150 in Summerside, Prince Edward Island. It's a beautiful day on the island. Um, and if you want to learn more about the ministries of Summerside Community Church, we encourage you to head to our website at summersidecommunity.church. Uh, also, just a quick reminder to stay informed on what's happening, because I know it's also different with COVID. With COVID. We want to encourage you uh, to stay tuned to our weekly email. In that, you'll learn all about the current things that are happening. Uh, that's where we first announced when we went to 100. Uh, and then we are working on figuring out how to navigate Kids Church, and so that's where that will be announced as well. If you do not receive those emails, please go to our website and do the Contact Us button, and we'll get you engaged with that email. A couple of things to highlight. Um, this morning, you may have noticed in the countdown, if you're here a bit early, there was some kind of Christmas music <laughs> going on. And so um, we are thinking about Christmas blessings. So last year, we had a chance to bless three families in our community that wouldn't have been able to celebrate uh, Christmas. And so we want to do that again. And so we are raising funds for that. And you can give through either the Tithely app or using the e-transfer or through your, if you're giving with cash or check, uh, and designate that towards towards Christmas blessings so we can bless some families in need in our community. And Operation Christmas Child is in full swing. Uh, there are three weeks left to collect those boxes, and so they're at the exits when you go ahead and when you leave today, you can collect one of those boxes. Um, and then uh, Colby Lidstone, Matt Brooks, and a few others have been working very hard on our youth room. And the big reveal is this coming Thursday for our youth, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, so there'll be a party in the youth room <laughs> on Thursday. And so we're looking forward to that. Uh, and then after the youth see it, then, then you guys can see it. <laughs> so there'll be a video next Sunday. Um, and again, we're excited to be able to have 100 in our building. So we've got two groups of 50. Uh, in our space here, and I know it's a little bit different, so let's embrace what we have and engage in our time together, and uh, if you're singing, we want to just encourage you to make sure you're wearing a mask, um, and we are going to be doing communion this morning, which we're excited about, and so uh, we'll walk you through those instructions when we have communion, and then we will be doing ministry time at the very end as well. And this morning, uh, it's great to see we've got lots of kids here this morning. So welcome to all of our children. Uh, we do have kids church on Zoom at 9.15. Uh, and in-house, we just want to encourage our kids to, to worship and engage with us, with us. There's flagging, there's drawing, and at home, kids worship through play. And so we just encourage families to find ways to engage your kids with play as it's a form of their worship. So today, we are continuing our series on hope. Um, and Josh Hofford's going to be speaking on hope this morning. Andrew Bryce uh, and Shirley are away visiting Peter, their son, and their grandchildren in New Brunswick. So they've had a wonderful week away, and so that is where Andrew is this morning. Um, and uh, we had a wonderful Sunday last Sunday. So many stories uh, from last week. But many of you were encouraged by the new wine worship encountering hope last Sunday, uh, both in person and online. We've heard wonderful stories of encouragement. God encountered and showed so many of you in beautiful and creative ways his presence. And so thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. It's so encouraging to hear these. And if God has been doing some cool stuff in you, I just want to encourage you to tell someone, um, not just us, your pastors, but your brothers and sisters in Christ. Our testimonies of his work are so life giving. And so we want to be able to share those with each other. So we don't always, we don't all experience him in the same way because we're all created uniquely and differently. And that's, that's a good thing. Uh, and it's our testimonies that help us build each other up. So we just want to encourage that this morning. God is for you uh, and he wants to meet you wherever you are at. And so when we encounter him, when we encounter Jesus, we encounter hope. And we often go looking for hope in all sorts of places. So in this world around us, there's lots of pseudo hopes, uh, lots of counterfeit hopes, and whether that's money, things, possessions, the car we drive, the house we own, work, status, whether we're single, married, our family name, our race, our skills, how we look, our education, our health, our knowledge, and our friends. These things often we put hope in, but yet the reality is these things are fleeting and they can be gone tomorrow. 
They do not possess hope. So what are you chasing after this morning that's not really hope? It's a false hope or a pseudo hope. Jesus is our hope. He wants to encounter us and show us what hope really is. And so it's our heart this morning that you'd encounter Jesus through our worship and through our message and through our time of communion, the one true hope. He is the hope of the world. And so this morning in our time of worship, teaching and communion, uh, we are creating a space to equip you, our community, to receive and experience God's transformational presence and power. And that's our hope this morning. And so Heather and our worship team are going to lead us in our time of worship. And so just encourage you just to come before him and just receive what he has for you this morning. Amen. Just stand with us this morning and respect your parameters. But Father, we just want to quickly pray. And God, we want to encounter you today. Lord, thank you that we... Uh, have the authority to walk into your throne room boldly. Lord, the veil has already been torn, and God, we know that when we encounter your presence, we are forever changed. So Holy Spirit, we invite you here. Help us to turn our hearts and our minds towards you now, God, and help us to encounter the real, true, and living God. Thank you that you are our hope. Thank you, Jesus.
lift your name. Give love. 
There's a song that's wanting to burst forth this morning. So I encourage you to just press in. Press into his presence. He's just waiting for us. He's waiting for us.
This is a very holy moment, Heather. You were right. God is here and he is moving. And I just, I sense his garment is moving through the room and we just have to reach up and touch it. Reach out to him. He is right here for you. He wants to touch. He wants to heal. He wants to restore. He wants to just shower on you his love. So just like the woman who had the issue of blood, just reach out and just touch his garment this morning. Just reach out. We have to reach out. We have to touch. He is here. He is moving. So just reach out to him. Let him come. Let him come. Let him touch. And then touch him. Receive what he has for you this morning. So let's just be in this place. And if you have a song, as Heather said, rising in you, whether it's a song in the spirit or a song, just sing that out. Jesus. Jesus, come. Just come this morning. We know you are here. Just reach out to him. Just reach out to him. He is so good. He's so good. And it may feel strange. It may feel weird or different. But he is no, he is a different God. He doesn't do things the way that we do things as any human flesh. He does things as he does things. And so just allow him to do what he wants to do this morning. Just reach out to him. We are hungry, God. We come and we want you. We just want you. We do not want man's ways. We want your ways. Help us to be the wild ones that step into what you have for us, God. We come to you, Father. We receive from you.
Atmosphere is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here. Let's sing that again. The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. Atmosphere is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here.
His presence is so strong here. And I'm just reminded this morning that um, it's his love that brings us to repentance. It's his love that shows us those things deep in us um, that he wants to shine his light on and he wants us to come before him and just say, I'm sorry. And this morning, God, I am sorry for putting false hopes ahead of you, for listening to voices that are not your voice. And Father, corporately, we are sorry, God, for putting things on the throne that are not you, for putting our eyes on man, and not you, for listening to voices that are not your voice. God, we want you, our first love. We want you. And so forgive us, Father. Forgive us, God, for allowing false hopes and false loves and pseudo loves, those foxes, those little foxes, Father compromise that you have said in Song of Solomon's God you've said catch those little foxes and I will help you I will help you do that and so father this morning we come before you we lay before you those compromises those false hopes and those false loves and we say forgive us father forgive us Because you come to us in your love and you draw our eyes to those things and you help us and it's not in our strength father it's not in our power but it's by your spirit it's by your spirit that we can come before your throne and we can lay those things before you and you carry them at the cross and you have forgiven us and we walk unpunishable in freedom because of that. And so, Father, we lay these things before you that are not you. And we thank you, God, that you are a forgiving God. And that you look at us with such love and such tenderness. And you say, my son and my daughter, I see you. I see your frailty. I see your struggle. And I am right there with you. And I will help you in this journey. You are not alone. You are not alone. And I'm just reminded this morning of this prayer I had shared in the prayer room before service. Um, Sabbath is an important day. Taking Sabbath rest is so important for our souls. God has put in us the seeds of eternity are planted in our souls. And Sabbath reminds us that six days a week we wrestle with the world, wringing prophets from the earth. But on the Sabbath, we especially care for the seed of eternity planted in our souls. And Lord, would you show us what it means to care for the seeds of eternity in my soul? Help me to stop counting the minutes to relinquish control. Inspire me instead to live and breathe with greater ease as an eternal being loved by you. 
It's not what we do or what we accomplish in this life. It's being with him and moving from that place of knowing him. So this morning, we just come before God and we just say, thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for the hope that you give us. And thank you for reminding us that you draw us to you through your love. It's your love that changes things. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. So this morning, um, Josh is going to be speaking on hope. And I just had a really strong sense from the Lord yesterday that before Josh speaks, um, to pray for him because tomorrow Josh is headed to a conference in Halifax, I believe it got moved, um, with a hundred pastors. And as as a pastor myself, and of course I'm newer at this, but um, there's a lot of weight right now and a lot, it's hard because everything that they've been used to, that I've been used to, has got changed in the last eight months. And so pastors are in a really hard place. Um, and I know Josh is going to bring encouragement to these pastors in this difficult season. And we want to bless him as a church uh, to bring the words and the messages of hope that these pastors need. And these are pastors from across um, Eastern, the Eastern bubble. Um, and so I know this has been a hard time for everyone in different ways. And leaders have had to make tough decisions on often very incomplete and rapidly changing information. And everything, like I mentioned, that, that we've been used to has changed. And there, there's criticism, and it's an easy time for misunderstandings because we're just not together. And so the difficulties that we're experiencing even here that Andrew and I expressed a couple weeks ago, uh, they're hard. And the hard part, the hurtful part, is that it's not unique to our body. Churches everywhere are facing a ton of challenges and leaders under a ton of pressure. And so um, many pastors in this season are leaving their vocations. And I actually know of a pastor this morning that is giving this hard news to his church that he's leaving. And that's really hard to hear. And we need our shepherds and we need to be praying for them and we need to be lifting them up. And so um, please be praying for church leaders, not just here, but for across our, our nation. Um, and pray that they would come um, for churches, that churches would come to Jesus, our first love, to guide us in this season, because we're all frail. Leaders, people alike, we need Jesus. He is the builder of the church, and we need him. And it's not by our might or our strength, but it's by the Spirit, says the Lord. And so I'm going to call Josh up now. And I've asked a few of our intercessors to join me, um, and I'm going to ask you to pray in unity with me as we pray for Josh this morning. Um, and so if I can get those I've chatted with earlier uh, to come up here with us. And uh, Josh and I were talking earlier. He's given them permission to be closer, closer to him. <laughs> and so, awesome. That's great. All right. Come on up, guys. Yeah, you're in the you're in the center of the stage, Josh. <laughs> um, and Josh, I just you know I think it is such uh, such a good thing that you are able to go and to be able to minister to these leaders. Um, and as I was just in worship uh, just before we came up, I just was like, God, what do you what do you want to say to Josh? And um, Josh, I know that you were sharing with me just this feeling of inadequacy um, with pastors from. You know, they've been pastoring for decades. But, you know, in this season and in this time, we're all on the same page because none of us none of us have been through this before. None of us know how to navigate this. There's no handbook that tells us how to navigate this. So we're all on the same playing field. We're all on the same plane. Um, and so I feel the Father saying, Josh, yes, you in your own strength and your own might, you are inadequate. You can't carry this on your own. But he is saying to you, my son, I have put my heart in you, and you carry my heart. And so as you go to speak to these pastors, 
I want them to know and meet me. It's not you I want them to meet. I want them to meet me in new and refreshing and real ways. I want them to understand, Josh, that they can be vulnerable, that they can be just, they can lay it out um, before me because I am their God. And I am the one that will give them the strategies that they need. I am the one that will give them the strength to carry what they need to carry in this season. I, God, am the one that sees clearly when they do not. And so, Josh, I want them to meet me in realness and fullness and in the power of my strength, not man's strength, but me. They need an encounter with me. And so, Father God, I just, I, as a body here at Summerside Community Church, uh, we bless Josh and in the steps that he is taking forward to minister to the pastors across Eastern Canada at this conference. And so, Father, I just pray an anointing on his feet, Father, that he carries the peace of your good news, that it is the peace that is in his feet as he walks the steps that you have put before him, that you will give him the peace as he steps into those things that he is to do. And so, Father, we thank you um, for the message of, of hope that you have put in Josh, the heart of um, a father that you have put in him that desires you and loves you and wants more of you. That heart, Father, we just pray that that would... Um, that Josh would have the words, Lord, and the actions and even the activities, whatever is to happen, Father, you know uh, what needs to happen. But, Father, we know that you're going to lead the way and you're going to give Josh what he needs uh, in the moment that he needs it, in the time that he needs it to minister to these pastors, Father, and these leaders in the church. And we thank you, Father. We thank you, God, um, that you have put Josh, Josh in this place for such a time as this. You have put him in this place to step out into minister for such a time as this. And um, it's good. It's good that he feels inadequate, Father, because that means he's going to have to rely on you and your Holy Spirit for what he needs. And so, Father, we know you're going to show up in special and unique ways, um, and you're going to minister, and you're going to restore, and you're going to give strength, and you're going to give hope in those places that can seem desperate and can seem so hard. Father, you're going to minister, and you're going to do it. And Josh is going to come alongside with you, and together um, they're going to step into those things, you and him. Thank you, Jesus. And so we just bless Josh. We bless um, his travels there. We bless his family during this time when he's away. Protect them, I pray, um, and just minister your peace in his drive and his time with you. And uh, we want to bless him. We're going to be praying for him. God, may he know the prayers of the people here are with him as he steps into the mission that you have for him. And we pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going now. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. I'm all prepared. <laughs> so, um, wow. <clears throat> you know, so one of the things that Tracy said... Um, It, well, I mean, before that, it, it, Jesus said, like, there's probably no better place to look than what Jesus said to learn how to navigate seasons like this, any season in life. We have to become disciples, and we have to continue to be disciples and continue to be discipled, which means to become like him. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. He's not, he, there's other places in Scripture, obviously, where he talks about possessions, finances, all that kind of stuff, but he, that's not what he's talking about in Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, not the poor in possessions, not the poor in money, not the poor in material wealth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So this means, in order to step into the reality of the kingdom of heaven, 
you kind of have to recognize your poverty. You kind of have to recognize that I can't do it. So I love what Tracy said because it just, it just, I was telling her this morning, I do feel inadequate to go speak to 100 pastors that have way more experience than me. But that was just such a, a helpful word from Tracy to say, you are inadequate. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Because <laughs> we all are. We all are inadequate. Every single one of us. If it's to be his strength and life through us, that means you are inadequate. I know too often when we get challenged with that, we think I've got to work myself up into self-confidence. But my confidence can't be in me. And it has to be in him. I am poor in spirit. I need him. I want the kingdom of heaven. I want to live my life in a way that responds to his rule and reign every single second. That everything I receive, because I'm in a kingdom, everything I receive doesn't come from the material things around me, but from him. And yes, that reception can be, of course, material things, but I acknowledge the source of where it all comes from not from my inherent ability, but from actually my acknowledging my lack. And that's a powerful place. And that, you know, that, I mean, speaking of hope, which is the, what we're going through right now is looking at hope, you're, that fits right in with hope. You know, Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, look it's, it's like verse 12 or something like that, 15, somewhere in there. I think I have it written down, but he says, look for your reward in heaven. What, what's your anticipation? What are you living for? I said a, a, when we, uh, uh, Andrew and I were going through the Mark series, I remember one of the, one of the times we were talking about what do you want to get out of this whole thing? This whole Christian life, what do you want out of it? you gotta, you got to come to grips with that question. Because a lot of us come under, under false pretenses to Jesus. I want a better marriage. I want a better job. I want to be blessed in life. I want peace in life. And when you speak to any young adult, they want to get married. <laughs> I, I was listening to a podcast, and one person asked the question, where do you go if you want to get married? And the person responded right away, to the church. <laughs> <laughs> you want to meet a single person to get married, go to the church. <laughs> like, what, what are you coming to this life for? Because <laughs> it can't be, I'm not saying don't get married, okay? I'm saying you're coming to this life not to get something out of it, but to put something into it. It's Jesus. I love there's this, uh, this Catholic nun in the 19th century. His name was, her name was uh, Teresa of Lisieux. I've probably talked about her before. And um, she wrote, she, she passed away, I think she was, when she was 24. She was inaugurated into the, um, into the convent when she was 12, I believe. And had caught a vision for serving God when she was six. She argued with her father for six years because he didn't want her to go. She argued with him for six years, and she couldn't let it down. She couldn't lay it down, and eventually he agreed. So she was 12. She was sent to the, to the convent. And uh, she says this. She, she, in, her, in her book, the one book that she wrote, The Little Flower of Jesus, Teresa of Lisieux, she says this. Alas, the world knows well how to combine its pleasures with the service of God, how little it thinks of death. And yet death has come to many people. I knew then, and many people I knew then, young, rich, and happy. I recall to mind the delightful places where they lived and ask myself, where are they now? And what profit they derive today from the beautiful houses and grounds where I saw them enjoying all the good things of this life. And I reflect that all is vanity besides loving God and serving him alone. 
which is essentially summing up the book of Ecclesiastes. All is vanity besides loving God and serving him alone. We put our hope in all kinds of different things. And when we put our hope in all kinds of things, and those things end up becoming our idol that we serve. So if your hope is in getting married, you know, playing on that example, your idol becomes getting married, and you can't find fulfillment until that happens. But guess what? Once you get married, you're going to realize that it doesn't bring fulfillment. <laughs> yeah, it can make you happy, but that's not, it's not easy, <laughs> It's good, but it's not easy. So we put our hope in all these things that end up becoming the idol. Tracy, I love how she said um, that, that God wants to sit on the throne. We put other things on the throne. You know, in the tabernacle, I'm not gonna get into this deeply. In the tabernacle, the temple in the Old Testament, the very central figure of that was the ark. You guys know the Ark of the Covenant, right? Placed in the center point of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. On the tabernacle is the mercy seat. The mercy seat is the place where blood was sprinkled. The, the, literally, so literally in the temple, in the tabernacle, in the deepest place, in the place that represented the presence of God, is a seat to sit on. And then Jesus goes along and Paul picks us up, Peter picks us up, Jesus saying, I'm the temple, and Peter and Paul saying, we're the temple. So using the analogy, we're all a temple collectively as living stones being built up to glorify God, but individually as a place that houses the Holy Spirit, that right within you is a seat that he longs to sit on. You have a throne in your heart, and God longs to occupy it. The problem is we put all our hopes, wishes, and dreams on that throne and forget that he longs to sit there. So like early on, in the, in, especially in the prophetic circles, every single prophetic person, almost all of them, were prophesying how quickly this whole COVID thing was going to end. And when there were words saying it was going to be over by Easter, <laughs> you know how many of them come out and said, I'm sorry, I was wrong? <laughs> I could probably count them on one hand. As far as I know, I could probably put up one finger. Like there was hope. False hope was given because these are the things I want to see happen. These are the the prophets of Jerusalem prophesying peace, peace, and God says, I'm not saying that right now. Well, because your hope isn't in the circumstances changing. If your hope is in the circumstances changing, I got another thing for you. (laughs) Because guess what? More circumstances come. Is your hope, if your hope is in your ability to weather the storm, eventually the storm will get the better of you. And I'll just think of the, the storm that we're going through. You know, many of, many of us were like, well, I can hold, I, you, know, I, you know what, just public confession time. I didn't prophesy this publicly. I, and I've told Tracy this, and my wife knows, a couple of people. I circled on my calendar, I think it was March 31st, and I said, it's going to be over by then. <laughs> it's going to be over by then. Luckily, I didn't publicize that. <laughs> beyond a, a poly, beyond my failure. <laughs> because I had a hope. And I could think of all the, the reasons. I mean, I had a whole schedule in 2020 that was going to be busy until Jan- I had things scheduled until January 2021. I wanted that stuff to happen. What happens when you have, John Paul used to tell us this, when you, deception comes only because you have a want to. I had a want. I wanted to go do all these things. I wanted to go back to India. I wanted to go to uh, all these different countries in Asia that were calling me up and wanted me to go. And so I wanted it to be over by March 31st because I had something scheduled April 14th. So I had false hope. And I think a lot of us had false hope that it was going to be over. But our hope isn't in something changing. It can't be. And one of the things, weathering through this whole 
last year has been helping us to reorient where we place our hope. It's not on my ability. Hope, my hope isn't in others, that others will change, or others will help, or others will come along. That may happen, but it also might not. Romans 5, uh, verses 1 to 5 says this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And then he goes on and says this, now hope does not disappoint. How many of you have been disappointed and had things that you hoped for that disappointed you? But, he, but Paul says right here, hope does not disappoint. What is hope that does not disappoint? And he answers it, by the way, in the very next words. But what is hope that does not disappoint? He says this, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. So what is hope that does not disappoint? Hope that does not disappoint is that God's sure and precious promise to pour his love out to you abides each and every day with you. Hope does not disappoint because he is with you. Why do I have hope that does not disappoint? Because I can go, oh, there he is. Not because I can go, by April 15th, it's going to change. March 31st, it's all going to go away. Hope because in the midst of all of that, he's there. His love is being poured. See, hope, only, hope is only birthed because of encountering his presence. It's the only place hope is birthed. Everything else is false hope. Hope that does not disappoint is the love of God being poured out in your hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to you. Hope is an encounter with his presence. I want to look at just two examples in Scripture, because what I want to do today is move to a place of, move into communion. Again, communion is a place of encounter. We've, talk, we've talked about this, but communion is a place of encounter. Communion, Jesus, it, it wasn't just about thinking lovely thoughts. Jesus said, this is the tradition that you do to be like like it, it's called the lord's supper because we're all having dinner together it's an actual practical reality of his presence being ingested by you so communion is an encounter so i want to move into communion but i want to share a couple thoughts regarding two passages in the gospels before we go there okay the first one is the man at the pool of bethesda in john 5 <laughs> But think about this guy. You guys know the story. This, this says there's many people around the pool of Bethesda. The belief was that an angel would touch the waters at the pool of Bethesda, stir the waters, and if you happen to jump into the water at that particular time, that you would be healed. Okay, that sounds a lot like hope. I'm sick. If I jump in when the waters are moving, I'll get healed. What's my hope in? My hope is in something, tradition, some thought process. Now, maybe it happened to other people at some point. My hope is in the story of others. They got healed by doing it. This guy's sitting here, and he's now lost hope because he said, I got nobody else to throw me in. So he used to hope in others. He used to hope that someone was going to come 
and they would drag me into the water and throw me in at the specific time. So he hoped in the tradition, and he hoped in the presence of other people helping him. And, he, so, and, and the whole of that is that he hoped that his circumstances were going to change. He said, hope in all kinds of things. Jesus comes up to him, says a, just an awesome question. I love Jesus. Hey, what do you want? Like, like think about this. This is the pool of Bethesda. There's most likely hundreds of sick people around waiting to be, everybody's waiting to get into the pool when the water stirs. Jesus goes up to the one guy and says, what do you want? And you kind of think this incredulous response from the guy, well, what do you mean what do I want? I want someone to throw me in the water when the water stirs. No one's doing it though. <laughs> like you think about this, this is Jesus, fully God, fully man, pretending like he doesn't know what the guy wants. When Jesus asks a question like this, his question isn't for his own information. One, the practical reality is everybody knew what that guy wanted. Two, is that Jesus is fully God, and we already know throughout Scripture, the Gospels anyway, that he can discern the thoughts of other people. It does it many, many times throughout the Gospels. So it's not like he's confused as to what this guy wants. What do you want? Or put in the context of our conversation today, where is your hope? This gets the guy thinking. The question's not for Jesus' sake, it's for his. Where's your hope? What do you want? Like I said earlier, what do you want out of this whole thing? What do you want? You know, the, as, as the story goes, the guy tells Jesus what he wants, and Jesus doesn't give him what he wants because he wants someone to drag him in. But, you know, you hear that. How, how <laughs> we want Jesus to show up a specific way, a specific time, doing a specific thing. We ask him to do it all this way. <laughs> so just, throw, just drag me and throw me into the water. That's what the guy's asking Jesus to do. But Jesus isn't interested in doing it his way. So Jesus goes, he heals the man, tells the man to take up his mat, walk away. So immediately he was well, he took up his mat, he walked away, and it was the Sabbath. So, you know, Jesus also loved to stir controversy up, which is fun, because you weren't supposed to do that on the Sabbath. So this is funny, okay? Think about the hope and the circumstance changes, all right? The guy, if your hope is in the circumstance, Jesus heals the guy, he gets up, he takes up his bed, he walks away. The very first thing that happens is he creates a religious uproar. <laughs> so he's thrust into a controversy. The Pharisees are seeking him out. They wanna, they're thinking about killing this guy. He's thrust into a controversy that you can't be healed on the Sabbath. What are you talking about? You can't talk about Jesus. This guy's just contravening the Sabbath. So he goes from, oh man, this is awesome. I've been healed to, oh, I've been rejected by the leaders of the entire city and they're out to get me. So one circumstance goes to another circumstance. But he found his hope. Because all he could do is talk about Jesus. And then Jesus comes to him again. See, his reason became Jesus. Not the circumstance, not, it, it, it shifted dramatically. The encounter with Jesus dramatically shifted. How, like, I just met God, and now God is with me. 
the encounter dramatically shifted his focus. Not others would come help me, not that everybody else's responsibility, not that somehow I'd, I'd trust in the tradition, I'd trust in the religious outcome, all of those things. No, now his reason becomes Jesus. He can't help but talk about it. So you need hope. If you're lacking hope, remind yourself of where he's been in the past. Do this in remembrance of me. Remind yourself of where he's been in the past to encounter him in the present to give you hope for the future. Your hope is eternal. It's very different than the hope the world brings. Think about the woman caught in adultery, John 8. She's, she's dragged naked through the streets by the religious leaders of the day. Throws him and, to, and used as an object to accuse Jesus Try and catch him in a conundrum. We found this woman caught in adultery. And you know, you guys know the story. Jesus doesn't even pay attention to the accusation. I love that he just doodles in the sand. It's like we get really worked up about our failures. <laughs> Jesus is like, oh, huh. I imagine he's probably humming. And he probably wasn't wearing a mask. <laughs> so if the, the whole, as, as the story goes, I'm sure you guys know about this. He who is out without sin cast the first stone. Everybody says from the, from the oldest to the youngest began dropping the stones one by one by one. It's interesting that it talks about how the oldest ones dropped the stones first. The youngest ones held on for the longest time. They eventually all left, and then Jesus looks up, not even paying attention to what's happening. Jesus looks up and says to the woman, where are your accusers? And she says, they've all left. And he says, I don't accuse you either. Neither do I make a judgment against you. Go and sin no more. I mean, just this, this is beautiful passage. But, I mean, think about this woman, though, for just a second. Consider this. She, her circumstances stunk. She's still just been caught in adultery. She's still just had her whole life exposed to everybody in the city. She, it's not like she goes back and her marriage is perfect again. It's not, it's not like everything has been fixed in that moment. She still has to go back and deal with life. What shifts? Jesus. She still has to walk right back into the fray of a broken marriage, right back into the accusation and the stares from everybody else in the town. All the gossip, all the stuff going around, she still has to walk right back into that. Right back into temptation, all these things, but now something has dramatically shifted because she encountered Jesus. Something shifts. It's like, it's like with the man at the pool of Bethesda, it's like Jesus' last interaction with him is saying, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. This is what he says to her, basically. Go and sin no more. It's going to be okay. Trust in me. It's going to be okay. Hope that does not disappoint is leaning on him and listening to him whisper to you, it's going to be okay. And I think that those are the words we need to hear in this season. You know what? It's going to be okay. And it's not going to be okay because everything changes. It's going to be okay because he's with you. It's going to be okay because you can trust him. It's going to be okay because you can admit that you need him. It's going to be okay because you have a hope that does not disappoint. The love of God being poured out in your hearts because you've been given the precious promise of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere you walk, you are in a new kingdom, responding to a new sovereign. Not the prime minister, not the premier, not the queen. 
I guess we're still kind of connected with the queen. Your hope is just in him. And any time it crops up, God, what am I going to do? It's okay. I'm with you. It's going to be okay. I'm with you. It's going to be okay. I'm with you. See, this is the essence of communion. It's going to be okay. I'm with you. It's going to be okay. I'm with you. You know, struggling with marriage, it's going to be okay. I'm with you. Struggling with temptation, it's going to be okay. I'm with you. Struggling with physical things going on, it's going to be okay. I'm with you. Struggling with not having other people around you, it's going to be okay. I'm with you. All these, all every, I mean, the Bible is so alive today. These are all things we struggle with. And God has the answer. I am with you. Lean on me. It's not my, your strength. It's mine. Coming to grips with that reality and leaning into him. Allowing him, like, like I'll leave you with this, and, then, and I'm going to turn it over to Tracy. She's going to lead us in the communion. At the end of Song of Solomon, you've got this whole process where the Shulamite bride is being wooed by uh, the king. At the end of Song of Solomon in chapter 8, after this, after, I mean, she goes through, literally, she goes through hell to find him. She's beaten in the streets. She's mocked by people. She goes through the ringer to find the king. And one of the last statements that's made about the Shulamite bride is, who is this? She's unrecognizable. Okay, who is this? Not, oh, that's the bride. Who is this? So she's unrecognizable. Nobody knows. She looks radically different. And it says this, who is this leaning upon the shoulder of her beloved. She's unrecognizable because she's found a different strength. She's not leaning on her own. She's not walking on her own. She's being supported by the passionate lover she's found and walking with him out of the wilderness. She made it through the wilderness because she learned to establish her strength and trust on the one that would walk with her through the most difficult times. She found hope because she could trust. Hope that does not disappoint. It's going to be okay. I am with you. I want to just say that to you this morning. It's going to be okay. He's with you. Turn your heart to him. Anytime you realize your heart's not turned to him, turn it back to him. He's with you. He can't help it, by the way. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. He can't help it. It's who he is. He can't help but be with you. Because it's his nature. It's who he is. Tracy. Thank you, Josh. Oh, wow. Can I ask the worship team to, to join me as well? Um, so timely that we hear that message um, that Josh has shared on hope um, and that reminder that he is with us. And so we're going to take this time to come to his table and be reminded that he is with us um, and take this tangible action by taking communion. And so I'm going to give us instructions to to get the cup and the juice and come back to your seats. Um, and so there is just one communion table um, at each side. And so those of you at home as well to gather your communion emblems, your bread and your wine. Um, and so um, if you want to all stand, so what we're going to do is the communion servers are going to put a cup on the table for you to, to pick up on your own, and then they'll hand you the bread. Um, and then just come back to your seats. And so if you just want to line up and do that right now, that would be great, and our worship team will be playing um, while you're doing that. And then we're going to take communion together. So you're released to, to go to the table.
So I just want to encourage you just to be in that place of just knowing that right now he is with you and you are not alone. And as we come to his table to collect the bread and the juice, as that remembrance of him, I just want you to be in that place of just knowing how much he loves you and that we're all welcome at his table. Every one of us, he has enough for you. He has enough for you. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want. And so this morning, it's so good to be together, both in person and online, um, to come to his table um, and to experience his extravagant provision um, through his body that was broken and poured out for us so that we could and we can, we can have life and life to the full. And so we remember that this morning. And so I'm going to just read from Luke 22. And then we'll take the bread and then we'll take the, the juice and then I'll pray. So it says, and he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you.
Father, we thank you this morning so much for all that you have done for us. And for this reminder that true hope only comes from you. It's the only place that we can be anchored in the storm. It's the only thing, Father, you are the only thing that never changes. And so we can hang on to you and your truth. And so we thank you this morning for your broken body and your blood poured out for us and the life that that means for us. And we give you praise and honor and glory for what, for who you are, for who you are above all else and for the love that you shower upon us and for the sacrifice that you have made for us because you've loved us and because you love us. And so, Father, we receive today what you have for us. We receive your healing touch. We receive restoration. We receive this food into our bodies, Lord, to touch us in those deep places. And we thank you, Father. We thank you for what you've accomplished on the cross for us. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. And so this morning with that, uh, we do want to have some time of ministry. Um, and so if you just want to have touch from God, if you just want that encouragement this morning, um, we're going to offer that. And so online, uh, we are going to sign off. And I just bless you uh, as you go into your week. And may you know his strength when you feel weak. May you know his hope, which is the anchor for his love for you. And so we bless you as you go into your week to our online audience. Love you all.